Hi, I've been working as a software engineer for roughly a decade now. Now, surely that's not long enough to know everything, but it is long enough to have made a bunch of mistakes. And today I'm going to talk to you about those mistakes so that you can avoid making them or more realistically, when you make them, some alarm goes off in your head and you think, oh, that's that's the thing I almost told me about. Maybe, maybe I should think about this. And at first, we need to talk about the nature of software development. Software development is not typing on a keyboard. It's not having your butt in a chair. It's not having Slack open. It involves all of these things, but that's not the core of it. At its core, development is a creative process. It is cooperating with a team to solve a set of problems under a certain set of constraints. So a good engineer is a great communicator. They are able to explain their ideas, but more importantly, they are able to listen, actively listen, contribute to the conversation to guarantee that what the other party is trying to say is understood by both. And that's not a soft skill, by the way, to me, it's a skill period. Like if you don't have that, you need to work on it. But the other side of that is that you need to set clear boundaries for yourself. And there's a couple of reasons why. First, because doing your job involves a lot of thinking. For a lot of people, it's extremely hard to think while you're also trying to communicate. So for me, this is a good reason to keep meetings short and to the point so that you can alternate between thinking mode and sinking mode. Creativity is extremely annoying because it's not available on demand. You can't just turn it on and off. You need to give your brain room to breathe so that you can truly consider what the problem is and come up with simple and robust solutions. Working long hours is a good way to end up digging yourself into a hole, both technically and mentally. The second reason you need to set boundaries for yourself is that work is not your friend. Because the work you're doing is creative and because creative work is not simply sitting in front of a desk all day, Companies have created golden cages so that workers can not only sit in front of a screen at the office, but also have a snack and play video games and have a nap. Everything you could possibly need is made available at the office so that you never effectively have a reason to leave it. And it's all presented as perks. We have a gym in the office, we have showers, we have a daycare, which makes my point harder to make because those are things that are good, things that you need in order to have a healthy life but now they're tied to your employer, just like healthcare in the US. Not only do these make it much, much harder to change jobs, it makes you a lot more dependent on your work. Every waking moment has something to do with your work. It has found its way into almost every corner of your personal life. And this is what I mean by a golden cage, something that looks nice and comfy, but is essentially a trap. Now, what's amazing about that is that it doesn't only apply to offices. A lot of us are now working remotely. We're working from our home. But the same dynamic exists. When you set up your work email on your phone or install the Slack application, you are creating your own golden cage right here at home. Hopefully the golden part is that you've made things nice for yourself. You have a nice desk, a nice monitor, a nice chair, keyboard, mouse, everything you need to work comfortably. But then you can't resist knowing that there's an app for that thing you use at work that you could install on your phone. And it seems like a good idea at first, because one of the perks of working from home is that you don't need to be as professional in your appearance. I personally wear pants for every call I'm in, but I know a lot of you don't. And so it seems like if you were able to take work chat with you, you would be able technically to answer some messages while you're doing something else, like taking a walk or being in the toilet or cooking or just being on your bed. And in theory, initially when you install these, you say to yourself, I'm only going to do this during work hours. But that's a lie. That's how it starts. But then it's 10 at night and you're bored. There's nothing on Twitter. So you check the work Slack just to see if there's anything interesting going on. Because as an engineer, you are invested in your work. You care about the project and seeing it make progress makes you happy. You care about your colleagues that are in different time zones and you don't want them to get stuck on anything you could help them with. And the good news is that's an integral part of your job. It's why you were hired. And the bad news is, it's why you were hired. See, when companies recruit engineers, especially startups, uh, they look for highly motivated, passionate, self-driven individuals. People who deeply care about the work they're doing, the difference that they're making in the world. Some job listings mention things like going above and beyond. And the understanding is that you're going to do that during work hours. 
But the expectation is that you'll probably do that beyond work hours. In fact, work hours is a very weird and very recent concept. It didn't always work that way. And it's especially ill-fitting for creative work. See, companies have an internal conflict. On the one hand, they understand that creative work is hard to measure. It's hard to optimize for. No matter the amount of planning, there always needs to be some wiggle room because everything is so hard to predict. And because it's not something they can just automate, it's not a commodity. They are ready to make concessions. They will give high salaries. They will allow remote work. They will come up with a list of perks so that they can attract and hopefully retain talent. But on the other hand, as companies grow out of being a startup and they get more serious about this management thing, they fall into patterns where an employee is not to be trusted. It is a resource that needs to be monitored. Work output and productivity need to be measured. In fact, everything needs to be measured, not only by your manager, but also by your peers during performance reviews. There is a constant tension between the freedom that your workplace knows you need as a creative to do your job and the desire for them to be in control of what's going on, to be able to tell the future and make commitments to customers and investors. So if you take human resources, for example, HR or people ops, as we now tend to call them, they serve a useful purpose. There needs to be someone you can come to with complaints that isn't your manager or anyone above them, in case the problem is with your manager or anyone above them. But the problem with HR is that it's not a neutral party. Their paycheck is cut by the same entity that cuts your paycheck. When we think about company dynamics, we always need to consider incentives. The incentive for the marketing team is to increase brand awareness. The incentive for the sales team is to get more enterprise customers, maybe. Uh, but the incentive for HR is to keep the company out of trouble. When a company investigates a case of sexual harassment, for example, they don't do it out of a sense of moral obligation. They do it because it's the law. And for some other things, they do it because it's a social norm and violating those would be harmful to attracting and retaining talent, which in turn would be harmful to productivity, which ultimately would impact revenue. And we can't have that now, can we? HR is never protecting you. It's always protecting the company. If protecting you is good for the company, they'll do it. But there's many instances where it's just easier for them to fire you or ignore you or gaslight you until you quit, especially if you have a low profile and you're not a white man. If they determine that it's cheaper for them or less damaging to their reputation to do that to you and then fight you in court, then that's what they're going to do. And HR is not the only thing that at first appears friendly or positive, but that usually plays against you. If you go back to perks, unlimited PTO, paid time off, is one of them. On paper, it sounds great. Instead of having a fixed number of weeks, you can take off to do whatever you want. You get an unlimited amount of them. But here's the thing. It has been shown time and time again that this results in employees actually taking less paid time off. Again, there's a disconnect between the understanding and the expectation. The understanding is that you're going to be able to take as much time as you need, but the expectation is that because you care about your work so much and because you don't want your colleagues to have to work more because you're away, taking time off is going to be extremely hard to justify to yourself, which is something I find amazing about modern management techniques. The manager doesn't actually need to check up on everything you do. As an employee, because of the way certain metrics or incentives are set up, you're applying pressure to yourself on their behalf, well beyond the scope of what's actually on the contract you signed. So I'm not talking about the really obviously evil cases where your company is monitoring your mouse movements, for example, to make sure you're still at your desk. There is no question that this is a messed up thing to do. I'm talking about the things that are more subtle, again, that appear to be in your favor, but are actually definitely not. Remember, the house always wins because it knows the odds. And the culture we have around software development is actually making everything worse. There's a lot of gatekeeping going around, which not only discredits some engineering positions, claiming that they're not really as engineery as the rest of them, so you don't have to take them seriously. And also, they don't deserve to be paid as much, which is just awful. But also, generally, in and outside of software, there's this conception that work to be worth anything must involve suffering. It must involve some amount of displeasure. It probably has to involve long hours and unhealthy habits, 
Because presumably the complexity of the task we're trying to achieve justifies any sacrifice, even friends or family. And if you're not willing to sacrifice those, if you somehow cling to the notion that having a separate personal life is essential to being a balanced human being, then you're not worthy. And you're never going to make a name for yourself, let alone make anything great. But that was never part of the deal. Greatness was never a requirement for the job. What you've actually signed up for is sharing your expertise and, to a lesser extent, your labor. You are mostly here because you know things and you know how to learn more things and how to teach them and how to apply them to solve problems. But if there's no one to stop you, it can be very tempting to work after hours or on the weekends to perfect your craft and contribute to open source projects some of which you may use at work, perhaps to make your professional life better. Your company does not pay you to do that. It may expect you to, because that too has become a social norm, and that too is messed up. You'll notice that I'm not giving a lot of solutions here, because the truth is, as a software engineer, no matter your salary, your impact on these cultural and organizational matters is limited. All you can do for yourself is to make sure that what it is you're doing actually is required of you. Which to some may sound like doing the bare minimum, which culturally is frowned upon. But you know what? Fuck that. That is a bad cultural bias. It doesn't have to be this way. And to some others, only doing what is required may sound boring. Which is fine. I promise it is. Work doesn't need to be the place where you go look for excitement. You can have hobbies, you can do things for your own physical and psychological enrichment. In fact, actively going against using work to fill your every need is probably the most radical act of self-care you can do today. You can be a qualified, highly effective professional while fiercely defending clear boundaries. You can be a good colleague while consistently signing off early and never answering outside of your office hours. The way to unblock your colleagues is not to be always available, it's to document things in a way that is organized and searchable so that you don't personally have to be around to explain them. Which is something that takes time, but is very much worth the investment. It's not a problem in itself to enjoy work. I find that there is joy to be found in almost every task, no matter how unappealing it seems at first. This is a quality, but that also doesn't mean that this is the only thing you should do with your life. If you find yourself struggling with a particular problem at work, or needing some time to think, you don't need slack on the phone to do that. Just walk away. Take a literal walk away from work, because, and everyone has been saying this for decades, the way we solve complex creative problems is by focusing our brains on something else. Which is another reason why working hours is an ill-fitting concept. You can't magically stop thinking about those complex problems the minute you sign off. They live rent-free in your head. If you care about the quality of your work, you owe it to yourself to take real breaks, to focus your attention elsewhere, so that you can forget about work and return with a fresh perspective. And this is not a bad deal for your company either. I'm going to be addressing managers now. Whether you know it or not, complete, self-actualized, well-rested and balanced human beings do their best work. High turnover is not sustainable in an engineering organization. Every person that leaves takes with them the knowledge that they didn't have the time to document because the pressure was so high. It is a net loss. It is a bad bet. If people are leaving, you need to take a good, honest look at how you're running things. Remember why you hired those people in the first place. The trust that you had that they were going to perform well within the organization. That trust needs to remain there throughout their time with you. You've hired self-driven, highly motivated, passionate people. There's absolutely no need to push them or monitor them. On the contrary, because of the cultural context and the general need for human beings to escape the dark reality we all live in now, it is your duty to care for them by giving them space to grow and holding them back well before they're in danger of hurting themselves or their family. Enforce PTO, enforce signing off, be proactive, don't break folks and families. This is your number one responsibility as a manager. And as for us software engineers, a final word of advice. If you can't do this for yourself, do it for your colleagues. Remember that by doing extra work, you're often hiding organizational dysfunction. 
If the company cannot do everything it wants to do without overtime, they're either over committing or understaffed, sometimes both. You cannot fix that by putting in extra effort. You're only hiding the problem at the cost of your own health. What's even worse is that you're setting a precedent, an unrealistic standard to which your peers and your future self will be compared to. Don't play yourself. Just sign off. Well, that's all for me today. I hope this has been helpful to some of you. Uh, if you want to talk more about it, you can find me on Twitter at Faster Than Lime. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, and subscribe. This video was made possible thanks to my patrons, whom I deeply appreciate. Uh, if you'd like to support my work, you can head over to patreon.com slash faster than lime and chip in five or ten dollars a month. It helps a great deal. Uh, thank you so much for watching, and until next time, take care.